<clears throat> Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Movies You Missed, the show where we discuss movies, like the title says, that you might have missed, whether that be because it's been lost in the sea of time and just the hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of movies that exist, or because you heard it wasn't good so you never got around to watching it, or it's not readily available. You know, I actually find, interestingly enough, that in this streaming age, so many things aren't really available to stream. Isn't that so strange? Like this movie that I, that we're watching today, or that I watched today, that we're going to discuss today, um, which, I'm sorry, it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake from 2003. I know I said that we were going to watch totally different movies. I gave you even possibilities. I said, oh, it's going to be The Awakening with Charlton Heston, or it's going to be Time Cop, or it's going to be John Frankenheimer's Prophecy. I know I dangled all those pieces of candy right in front of you, and then just went with something completely different, but um, you know, I've always said this, and I'll continue to say this. I go where the watch takes me. You know what I mean? I watch whatever I feel like watching. Like right now, I'm on a horror kick, and within that horror kick, I'm attempting to watch all the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies in preparation for the new one coming out in early February. Um, so in the spirit of that Texas Chainsaw binge within a horror binge, you guys are simply going to be following me down that rabbit hole. And, you know, I have a penchant for horror movies anyway, so, like, you know, you should, I, I think, just probably get used to it. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of horror movies on this podcast, whether they be, you know, psychological, like, thriller horror, slasher, sci-fi horror. Um, it's just going to, it's going to be, a, it's going to be on the table. It's going to be a topic of conversation. I watch a lot of horror movies throughout the year, not just around Halloween, Throughout the year, every year, as long as I've been alive. I've been watching horror movies since I was a kid. You know, people love horror movies. They love the, They love how taboo it is. They love how all over the map they are, I think. You know, they can elicit, like, real emotion, or they can just be fun. You know, there's so much to love about the genre. And I'm constantly in a state of flux where I'm like, Oh, I want to watch these, I want to watch this, I want to watch that. Um, and right now we're doing horror. Hopefully I can pull out of that soon, just so I can give you guys a bit of variety, I guess. But for now we're talking horror, specifically Marcus Nispel's Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake from 2003. But anyway... As I was saying before that long tangent, I um, I attempted to find this movie on a streaming service because even though I do own it on VHS, I wanted to be lazy and I wanted to watch it um, on my fire stick in my bedroom so that I wouldn't have to get up and keep. So what's go? Let me let me let me explain to you what's going on with my VHS situation. So I have a VHS player, right? I have multi. I have like two VHS players, both of which don't have remotes. So if I want to pause the movie and take a note, pause like you know, pause the movie to go to the bathroom, I have to I have to physically like get up and press it. So I had to do that like a million times. So I prefer not to watch movies for this podcast on VHS. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big proponent of VHS. Um, it does a lot. I think it does a lot for cinematography. I think it makes things look old and grainy, um, which I think always adds to a movie. Also, you know, there's the nostalgia factor because it was how I grew up watching movies. Uh, I love VHS. Don't get me wrong, but sometimes I'm just like, man, I'd really like to be able to just hit a remote and pause it, hit a remote and play it, just like that, without having to get up, walk over, do it, go back and sit down. It does get tedious having to do that, like, I don't know. 20 to 30 times I have to to take a long note during a movie. Um, but yeah, couldn't find this movie anywhere streaming. Um, and by the way, I have Netflix, Hulu, 
and Prime Video, Peacock, HBO Max, Disney Plus. Not that it would ever be on there, but I have all these streaming services, and I couldn't find this this remake for free anywhere. Like it's like unbelievable. It's like oh, you want to rent Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003 for 3.99? No, I do not. Like it amazes me that even in this age of streaming services, that like. Like, if I have, like, the big five, if I have Netflix, if I have Prime Video, if I have Hulu, if I have Peacock, if I have HBO Max, every movie that exists should be on one of those. I'm sorry. That's just the way I feel. And the fact that, like, actually, I did some I did some looking, and you can only find Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original, is, is streaming free if you have Prime Video. And that's only the regular version. If you want the 40th anniversary edition, for some reason it's $3.99. It's the exact same movie, I'm pretty sure. But, like... I know if you want Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Next Generation, uh, Leatherface, um, the prequel one, Texas Chainsaw Massacre in the beginning, This the prequel to this movie. You can't, I don't, they can't find them anywhere. Um, and for some reason, they didn't have any of these movies at the local library, so I had to put holds on them through the local library website, and they're going to get it in for me, and I'm going to go pick it up. Also, I'm in the process of getting... Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1, 2, 3, 4 on VHS from an online dealer through Facebook Marketplace right now. But even so, these movies, not that easy to come by for some reason. So I was forced to watch this movie on my VHS player, which is, you know, no, you know, no big deal. I like it, okay? I have in my house a streaming room, or a screening room, basically, because I don't stream anything, uh, where I have my Laserdisc player, my VHS player, DVD player in like a little room with like a nice little couch blankets there's a lamp it's got a, one, a big box TV that I brought up from my basement okay it's a nice little cozy area that I will watch movies in so I got to watch a movie in there it was nice usually for this podcast I watch the movies in my bedroom uh, but again was it a pain in the keister to have to keep getting up and to pause the movie to take a note yeah it was but I, it's worth it because I do it for you and for myself um, but anyway yeah uh, I'll briefly explain my history with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series uh, in that I really have none um, I've actually only really got into this series recently because I um, like I said I've been doing a horror binge and in the last um couple I think like six or seven months I've watched like the big three horror franchises like Nightmare on Elm Street Halloween Friday the 13th I watched all those movies hence you know the Friday the 13th part five episode last week um and I thought you know I really do like horror movies doy and I like watching franchises because I do like franchises and I think it's because I'm a stupid person I think it's because it takes the element of choice out of what you watch next and I think it takes away one more decision that I really don't have to make um I don't know what that says about me per se but I uh I just know that like if I'm watching a movie and then there's a movie that immediately follows it that you should that like is suggested you watch I'll be like yeah okay I'll watch it that's fine does that always work out in my favor most of the time no most franchises have a lot of duds and very few good movies. Um, but like, I think six months ago, I watched The Nightmare, uh, during the summer, I watched The Nightmare on Elm Street movies, which, you know, there's some underrated um, films in that trilogy, or in that the trilogy, in that, uh, in that series, so that we can get to later on. Um, and then I think on, ha- around Halloween, I watched the Halloween movies, just to get into the spirit which there's some definitely underrated movies in that series as well. Um, and then me and my girlfriend in preparation for the new Scream movie attempted to watch the Scream movies in order, which I've seen on them all before. I think I watched those like, just like maybe like four years ago. Uh, and we got through the first two, which those are properly rated. Those are excellent movies, obviously. Um, maybe four is a little underrated. I don't know. But even so, I've been watching franchise And then I watched Friday the 13th, like, you know, obviously within the last, like, three weeks, because, you know, that's probably my favorite, not even just horror franchise, one of my favorite franchises, uh, period. Um, So, yeah, I was just like, well, what's logically what's next? If I'm keeping with horror, I'm keeping with franchises, what's next? And it's like, oh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 
Also, you've never really explored those movies at all, so that could be fun. Uh, I know those movies are definitely all over the map. So, um, and I, I don't think they get a lot of coverage. Like, I listen to a lot of movie podcasts, and I listen to ones that specifically cover horror movies. And it seems like some some people, like, specifically stay away from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies, which I don't really get. I mean, sure, they're all over the map, and I'm uh, from what I've heard, there's a lot of duds. Um, but, you know, I think there, it's like, you know, there's some, obviously, some really bright spots, and I don't think you can shy away from all of the movies just, uh, be, you know, based on the bad ones. Because, like, you know, what I know about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series is, um, 1974, the original, directed by Tobe Hooper? Toby Hooper? I don't know. Um, couldn't tell you. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, yeah, 1974, classic, with one of the first slasher movies that existed, um, set the precedent for, like, you know, big, hulking creatures carrying, uh, unorthodox, big machinery to murder people. Um... You know, and then 1986, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, um, Hooper directed again, but this time it was like a horror comedy. Uh, and then Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3, some years later, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation in the 90s. Then there was the remake in 2003, which we'll talk about today, followed by Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Beginning, which is a prequel to this remake. Interesting. Um... And then I think they did Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Texas Chainsaw in 3D in 2013, which I actually have seen that movie. And people bash that movie, but I actually kind of remember liking it. Um, and then they did another prequel, I think, but a prequel to the original. Also, Texas Chainsaw 3D is like a retconning, I think, because it's like it, it's a direct sequel to the original. You know how they like to do that uh, with like Halloween 2018, and and like movies love doing that where they're just like, well, Halloween did that like three times where they're like those movies and the other the other sequels they don't count, don't count those. This is this is this is this is canon or whatever. Um, and then I think they did um, Leatherface in like 2017, which was a prequel to the original. And then they're, I think, making a direct sequel to the original now in 2022. They're releasing it via Netflix, which I will definitely be watching. But yeah, my history with these movies is very scattered all over the map. The first one I ever saw was actually this one. And I, this movie released in 2003 when I was seven years old. So uh, I don't think I watched it for a while after that. I think I, I saw it. Uh, I saw it. I think I watched it with a group of people at a friend's house when I was in the 7th or 8th grade, I think. So this must have been like, ooh, let's, let's do that, let's do that. I think it was like 2011, 2012. So I watched it, and I don't think I watched all of it. I think I watched like 75% of it at a, a friend's house, uh, at Amber Ammon's house when I was in middle school. And, you know, shout out to her. She owned it on DVD. I think her family was one of those people where they just like collected DVDs if they found them in bargain bins or like a Goodwill or something or like a flea market and they just bought them up or just like yeah this looks fine let's watch this which those people kudos to you you're very interesting and you take gambles uh, and I don't think anyone at the party was really into it though so I think that's why we shut it off but I remember liking it and then I think when Texas Chainsaw 2013 came out I think I rented it on DVD and I watched it and I remember liking it so that could be one we do on this podcast because people really hate that for some reason. But I remember liking it. That's what's uh, that's with Alexandra, Daddario, and Trey Songs is in it. And I don't remember it being bad. I remember it being kind of silly, I think. But I remember the premise being interesting. So maybe we'll explore that in the future. Um, and then just uh, four days ago, I watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original, 1974, via Prime Video. Uh, and I, of course, it was amazing. Um, it was not necessarily like intense or flashy or like quick or fast paced or anything like that. And it wasn't scary, but like it was eerie and discomforting. 
and it seems almost too real. Like this movie, um, I don't know. It takes, I think it kind of takes the piss out of the original because it makes it like, it's like more fun and faster paced. Uh, of course, thanks to like Michael, the Michael Bay of it all. Um, but like, I think the original had like a, had like, there was some nuance and there was like a lot of like, practical effects stuff when practical effects was really like gritty and gross and like it looks so real and there's like a lot of occult cannibal stuff that I think people just generally myself included of course find really really kind of unsettling um but of course it was terrific it was a masterpiece it was a little slow um because I think I, I've grown I'm a part of a generation that's grown up with like horror movies needing to be kind of faster and violent and gory and Texas Chainsaw Massacre original is not really like that if you think if you I mean if you watch the movie which I just did it's very fresh in my mind the kills are really not flashy or drawn out or really even focused on I think he beats like two guys in the head with a hammer and then one woman you don't even see her killed on screen she's just hung up on a hook and then you find her dead body later and then the main character's brother, Franklin Hardesty, is, like, cut in half. Or, like, cut down the middle, like, through the chest, down, um, in, in his wheelchair. But it's, like, not even shown. It is, like, the most graphical of the movie, I think, but it's still not really shown. Uh, which, by the way, the balls they had to kill a guy in a wheelchair. Like, yikes. They really went for it with that one. I know, I've known about that for that scene for forever before even watching the movie. Because I've seen it before, like, in, like trailers and stuff uh, but yeah I mean it's just like wow especially they make the guy in the wheelchair um, so likable and I'm like man he better get out of this I mean he's in a fucking wheelchair we're already feeling very sympathetic for this guy and then they just cut him in half it's brutal but yeah so I'm working on watching the next couple um, I'm working on getting them from uh, this girl I've been in contact with on Facebook Marketplace so we'll see how that goes I'll let you know uh, also, I have holds on them from the library, so whichever comes first. Um, but yeah, today we're here to talk about text just Sorry, flubbed. Uh, I'm surprised I actually don't do that more on this podcast. I do it in an everyday conversation like a million times where like I go to talk and like my tongue like trips over itself and it just um, sounds like uh, spitting noises. <laughs> um, the amount of times my girlfriend is like, what did you even just say? Uh, happens to me a million times. Uh, a day when I'm talking to her uh, but yeah so how did I watch this movie I watched it on my VHS copy did you hear the VHS being removed from the from the cover yeah, that's always a nice sound to me just like a VHS being in my hand is just a nice feeling I don't know it just makes me think of when I was young do you remember when you could rent VHSs from video stores? Do you remember when you could rent movies from stores? That was crazy. Um, um, but yeah, I watched it via my VHS copy. I don't have a very um, don't have a very lengthy history with the, the series at all. I'm definitely new to it. Um, but I'm into it. Definitely liked it. Um, why would you have missed this movie? this Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D. So let's think about it. Um, why have you missed most of these? Why have I personally missed most of these uh, TCM movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Um, why have most people I've talked to? I don't know, because maybe because, like, I think this series as a whole is overlooked a lot. Because, like, I think... When it comes to slashers, we kind of, we have a lot already, don't we? I mean, we have the Halloween movies, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, which, like, people really love, and, you know, they don't necessarily need more. Also, I think, like, the fact that the guy sews faces together to make a mask, and the fact that they're cannibals, and it's kind of a cult, and he uses a chainsaw, which is, like, a really violent, messy, gory way to kill people... I think it's, it might be a little too much for people. I think people like their horror movies to be like a little bit fun, maybe not as gritty a lot of the time. And like 
I don't know. I feel like people... Yeah, I don't know. It's just like, there's... Like, these movies are gritty. And maybe some of them are kind of difficult to get through. Because they're kind of so unsettling. Uh, and Leatherface is a very unsettling character to look at. Um, a lot of unsettling, disturbing elements about these movies. So maybe that's why people shy away. Like, if I could ask myself, why have I never seen any of these movies? Like, why did I see the original Halloween when I was, like, 12? But I didn't see the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre until I was, like, 24. These are great questions. Um, I don't know. Maybe I was saving it. I'd like to do that with movies, personally. But, um, but yeah, maybe it's just, like, I feel safe. I feel content with Halloween, with Friday the 13th, with Nightmare on Elm Street, with Scream. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I don't know. That's just me personally. But, um, you know, I mean, also this movie specifically, and a lot of the movies in that franchise, have gotten horrible, horrible reviews. And the fact that they're all over the place, um, in terms of, like, I think 1974 was the one, the, I, well, I know 1974 was when they released the first one, and they didn't release a sequel to, like, 1986, and it's been really sporadic. And I think especially, uh, like, uh, after, like, the first two and, like, all of the ones they've made after this one in, like, the 21st century have been very diminishing returns. Now, I can't say that for sure because I haven't seen them. And, you know, I love movies that everyone hates. I'm really good at I'm really good at that. I'm really good at finding things to like in any given movie. But, like, from what I've heard... They're very bad. So maybe... And it's just like... It's like the Hellraiser series too is very similar to that. Where I think the first one is good. But I think after that... It's like there's a lot of sequels that are just like that. Like uh, duds. You know? And people are like... I don't really want to keep watching these movies. If they're all going to be this bad. Like imagine like watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1. And then you watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And it's like a horror comedy... And you're like, oh, I didn't really like that. It's not really like the first one at all. And then you watch the third one, and you're like, oh, this is not great at all. Are you going to keep watching those movies? Are you likely to keep watching them? Especially, like, this movie in particular. Um, the fact that they even remade this movie is kind of mind-boggling to me, and I don't really understand why they would do that. I mean, of course I don't understand why they remake a lot of movies. Um, especially when they do it so right the first time. Um, but, and don't get me wrong, I'm glad they remade this movie. Because I think this movie is really fun, and I think it's a good companion to the original, actually. Because it's like it's like two sides of the same coin. Like it's the same story told in like two totally different ways. Like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original, is like excellent, and but it's like creepy and disturbing and unsettling and kind of quiet and slow. So it's like a good horror movie to watch by yourself. Like it's intellectual. Whereas this movie, it's like loud. It's fun. The people in it are very modern and attractive. Um, the acting is not bad. It's, I think, more relatable. And I think it's, like, just, like, a little bit schlocky, but also, like, well done in ways that count, like cinematography and acting performances. Um, and I think it's just, like, a, I think it's, like, it's, like, the two viewing experiences of horror, basically. Like, you can either have ones that make you think or ones that are fun. So this one, I'm glad they kind of remade. Even though I, I can see why initially people would be skeptical about a remake like this. Uh, also, yeah, because people hate remakes generally. Anyway. And also, slasher genre. <clears throat> like I said, very crowded already. Alright. So, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is an American slasher film directed by Marcus Nispel and written by Scott Kozar. You know, it is a, it's a remake of the 1974 film. And it's the fifth installment in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise overall. Uh, the plot follows a group of young adults traveling through a rural Texas, uh, you know, area. I don't think it expressly says where in Texas. I know it says they're like 45 miles from Dallas, and they're coming from Mexico. So they're going from Mexico to Dallas. So they're, I mean, they must be in like the southern tip of Texas. Um, and they, you know, this group of, of young adults encounter Leatherface and his murderous family. And are picked off one by one. I mean, so the, the film, I mean, you know, it's directed by Martin Marcus Nispel, who's a German director, a German-born director. Uh, he was mostly known for making music videos in, like, the 80s and 90s. 
Uh, and I mean, he made music videos for everybody. You know, it's LL Cool J, Janet Jackson, Mariah Carey, uh, and then like George Michael, Billy Joel, Elton John, the B-52s, uh, Tevin Campbell, Spice Girls. Um, and then he, you know, he got into film in like the early 2000s. He directed this. He then went on to direct the, um, also Michael Bay produced Friday the 13th reboot in 2009 and then he did a, a Conan the Barbarian reboot with Jason Momoa in like 2013 or something so yeah I think visually he's, he does some good things I think the Friday the 13th reboot especially like I watched that recently That's a, I like that one a lot that could be a good one because I don't think people really I don't think a lot of people like this one I don't think a lot of people saw it because they thought there wasn't a remake wasn't necessary but then they actually made a very, a very good and watchable film uh, so yeah Marcus Nispel uh, he uh, this is written by Scott Kozar, who uh, wrote the Amityville remake, Amityville horror remake with Ryan R Ryan Reynolds, the Deadpool guy. I don't know why I'm kind of blanking on his name, uh, and um, the other lady from Mean Girls. Her name is Rachel something, I think. Anyway, um, don't care. No, no, I can't remember her name. She was in Doctor Strange. I don't know. I'm having an off day today. Um, but yeah, so he directed that Amityville remake, which is absolutely horrible. Um, I mean, of course, there's some good parts. There's some parts I like. If you put it on, I would watch it. But like, as I think I know, it's like nothing compared to this one. Even though I, I think the writing might be kind of similar. And he also wrote The Machinist, that movie with Christian Bale, where he gets all skinny. Um, so the cinematography is uh, was, uh, you know, the film was shot by Daniel Pearl who shot the original, and then he shot uh, Alien vs. Predator Requiem, the F-13 reboot, and that horror movie The Boy with Lauren Cohen, if anyone saw that. Uh, he also shot the Every Breath You Take video, you know, the song by the police. And then he also shot the Meatloaf video, I Would Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That. You know, everyone loves Meatloaf. Meat meatloaf. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's interesting that, you know, this comes up because Meatloaf, I think, passed away two days ago because I'm recording this on January 23rd, 2022. It's a Sunday. It's 1.16 p.m. Uh, but so, yeah, Meatloaf died, passed away, I think, on Thursday of this week. So that's interesting that um, those two things would coincide. Um, so for this movie, uh, Hooper and writer and original writer Kim Henkel were producers, and then uh, it was also produced by Michael Bay through his uh, Platinum Dune Platinum Dunes production company. This was the first film that they that they put out. Uh, Michael Bay, you know, famous for doing Transformers, and um, you know, working with Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson on movies like The Rock and a bunch of other like high action, high paced, explosive movies. Armageddon. Um, so yeah, he formed a production company called Platinum Dunes initially to make low budget horror, low, low budget films. Um, and then they made this remake as their first film. The film was released on October 17, 2003, uh, and it actually grossed $107 million against a $9.5 billion budget. $9.5 million budget, sorry. Um, so yeah, it's um, it was actually a huge financial success, which probably is why uh, it spurred Platinum Dunes to cook up a bunch of remakes of 20th century horror films going forward um, but yeah so critically it was it was met with largely negative reviews and I could read you guys some of the reviews if you'd like later on uh, not that you'll be able to let me know but I, I, I will just because I think some of them were kind of funny um, but yeah this movie um, I think like critics hated it but I think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre fans and a lot of horror fans really loved this movie. Like, if you look at the ranking, if you, like, I, of course, I love looking at lists and stuff and, like, online movie rankings, like on Collider or Screen Rant or, you know, anything like that, or Ranker. Um, if you look at this movie and you look at, like, the Texas Chainsaw, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, Reddit, um, or is it called a subreddit? I don't really know how Reddit works, Reddit lingo specifically. Um, but if you look at that kind of stuff, this movie ranks pretty high. And I don't know if it's because there's a steep drop-off between, like, 
the high ones and then like this one but like i know here i have some i have some data here uh the the film um uh, ranked number three on movieweb.com's ranking of the texas chainsaw massacre franchise as well as number two on screen rants number three on slash films and then number three on colliders so i think usually the trend i saw was that like oh texas chainsaw massacre one and texas chainsaw massacre two are like number one and two obviously um and then this one is number three number two you know what i mean so like i don't know if that means that this one is really good in the people's eyes or i don't know if it's like one and two are really really good and then there's a steep drop off and then text chainsaw massacre 2003 is like the next best and then like they just get getting way worse after that but um but i don't know you they rank uh, this one ranks pretty high uh and i can see why i mean and you'll see why too when i get into it beat by beat in a second here but like i, I know for a fact that text chainsaw massacre 3d and like Texas Chainsaw Massacre the Next Generation with like McConaughey and Zellweger and um the all both the prequels and then I think Leatherface 3 uh are all like universally like I think mostly like universally panned even though I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3D and then Next Generation have a lot of elements that are good from what I've heard so like we may be able to talk about those in the future I know I want to do, like this summer, I want to discuss specifically sequels uh, in franchises and sequels to, like, popular movies. So, like, that would be a good time to, you know, get into some of these sequels. Uh, and But, you know, I'd have to watch them first to find out if they're any good or if they're really as underrated as they say. Takes a Chains on Massacre Part 2 apparently is, like, criminally underrated from everything I've read. So I guess we'll have to find out. Um, But yeah, also just interesting um, factoid here, the mask in this movie, uh, there's a ranking on screen rant of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Leatherface Masks ranked, and this one ranks number five. So that's pretty low considering there's only like seven or eight movies. So this one ranks pretty low, but uh, if you watch the movie for yourself, uh, you'll see that I think it's, it's actually pretty scary looking. I don't know. It's like much more like it looks much more like and it's i mean it's like heavily sewn but i think it looks much more like actual like human skin and like leathery than like a lot of the other masks so in my personal opinion i would rank it higher but um you know you can see for yourself by watching all the movies or just reading this article i'll put a link to this article and all the other screen rant collider articles i mentioned uh in the show notes but anyway here we can get into the movie beat by beat And believe me, it'll go quick. Uh, this movie really is slam bam in your face. Um, also, during the movie, I kept a kill count, of course, as I do with all horror movies I review. And then also, I, I did this fun thing where I took a count of what I called Michael Bay-isms, which um, are like, I don't know, things that don't necessarily have a place in a horror movie and feel crammed in there um, to like, spice up the sex and the action and the intensity of a movie and there's a bunch of these that i have here and if you can find your own let me know reach out to the email but i just think keeping track of these things um you know actions by characters you know things they say in michael bay movies is really fun and because a lot of the times no offense to michael bay i mean he's more successful than i'll ever be of course i think he has some shady character uh, traits but like i think he is like this weird Ho like a Hollywood macho man guy and he's just like he thinks people like really love like off the wall nuts dialogue that like no one would ever say and it's like quirky and like kind of crude and gross and weird and like also like explosions and intensity and just like shit that is batshit crazy so like I'll um I'll keep you updated on that I'll go over those as they come up and then at the end we'll do a tally um so like I slipped this VHS player. I slipped this tape in my VHS player, and of course the trailer start the trailers start rolling. Uh, and there's trailers for um, Ripley's Game, that John Malkovich movie, and uh, the Butterfly Effect with Ashton Kutcher. Do you remember early two thousands horror? It was a strange time for like thrillers and horrors in the early two thousands. Um, but yeah, both those movies. I was just like, huh, I forgot both those movies existed. 
I think both those movies are watchable movies that we could do on this podcast, if I'm being completely honest with you. Um, also, I'm testing out a new microphone today, and it looks like it's picking up sound really good. So, uh, you know, if there's any sound issues that you guys have, let me know. Because um, I don't edit this whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, it starts with the, the New Line Cinema logo. You know, it's like the, the square fong and then the reels of film coming around the corners and it's like the nice like dark brilliant blue and I don't know and seeing New Line always got me excited because it makes me think that I'm watching like Fry, uh, you know you know a Freddy Krueger movie or I think uh, The Mask is New Line Cinema too and I watched The Mask like with Jim Carrey a million times when I was a kid so uh, the Platinum Dunes logo though not so much not as excitable to me I uh, it's just like oh it's like serpentining and then it's silver, and then it becomes sand dunes. I don't know, man. I don't really care about sand dunes. You know what I mean? I don't really know why he named his production company that. Um, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not here for dunes. You know they are platinum. Um, so the movie, like the original, begins with grainy footage of like a crime scene. You know, bodies being pulled out of a river. Um, there's you know gritty shots of the Texas landscape. I think John Larroquette actually reprised his role from the original because there's a voiceover in the beginning of the original too and it's talking about how like heinous of a crime has been committed and how these three how these several teens these five teens couldn't have possibly expected what would occur to them today as they were driving through the texas countryside and um you know there's a classic voiceover and then the, this one includes a like there's an actual crime scene walkthrough video being taken by like two police officers and there's a very cop looking cop with like a serious mustache and a bald head and he's just like yep these were where the bodies were found and there's some fingernails and hair embedded in the wall over here and there's blood and it's like you know he's going through Leatherface's lair and he's shining a flashlight on things and he's talking about how like the, you know, the, the teens were murdered here and then it like it really begins the movie you know it cuts to these teens swimming at a watering hole and then Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinner is playing and I, I do think it's funny how like movies want to like epitomize the South and they want to like sum up the South so they play Sweet Home Alabama even though it's a movie that takes place in Texas because I think just like if you think of the South one of the first things you think of is like Sweet Home Alabama it's just like hey one of the most Southern things there is is Skinnerd. And it's actually funny because, like, these teens, or not, they're not teens, I shouldn't call them teens because they're grown ups. Jessica Beale's like 30. Um, they're going, they're on their way to see a Skinner concert. And I'm pretty sure it's like August of 1973. Um, so that does track. But yeah, so Sweet Home Alabama plays in the background while these teens, you know, it, it shows them driving down a dirt road. Uh, and Jessica Beale and Eric Balfour. Who uh, I, I I'm sorry I wanted to get into just I wanted to get into who stars in this movie I totally didn't even get into that so just uh, let me break down that that down for you really quick I must have skipped that um, so the film stars Jessica Biel right who we all know as Justin Timberlake's wife um, I mean she's done some stuff she was in that show Seventh Heaven if you guys watched that I think I saw some spare episodes when I was a kid um, she was in the Blade Trinity she was in the Total Recall. Re remake that they did that uh, she loves being a remakes um she was in like valentine's day and new year's eve and uh just some movies that are not terrific um i mean she's like a very attractive talented woman i mean she's not terrible in any of these movies i've ever seen but uh, i don't think she i don't think she just chooses she doesn't choose good stuff to be in necessarily um even though she did executive produce and star in that show the sinner with bill pullman which my my parents tell me is very good um also, she's like anti-vax, I guess, though, which is not 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 great. Um, and she was in that movie Next with Nicolas Cage. You guys remember that movie Next with Nicolas Cage and uh, Julianne Moore? That could be what we do on this podcast. That movie's that movie's quite a romp. But yeah, so Jessica Biel is in this movie. Um, Jonathan Tucker, who uh, I think he was in Westworld. He's been in a bunch of TV series. And movies. Um, I think he actually 
in this movie he plays like the dork character because he's got like glasses and sideburns and like a little afro but I think he uh, if he takes off his glasses he's actually a dick I think he plays a dick in most movies uh, he's in the virgin suicides and he has a certain look about him where he, he looks like he plays dicks um uh, it also stars Erica Leeshin, which, uh, if Erica Leershin, Leershin, if you've seen Blair Witch 2, which hopefully you haven't, uh, she's in that movie. Um, Mike Vogel from Under the Dome and from, I personally, I mean, I've seen him in Under the Dome and then he was in the first season of Bates Motel. And then, uh, Eric Balfour from the sci-fi series Haven, and he's been in some stuff. If you guys have, if you guys are Eric Andre fans, he has probably one of my favorite interviews with Eric Andre, um, because he, he gets, like, really pissed off and he insults Eric Andre for, for uh, you know, because Eric Andre was obviously being weird, and you know how Eric Andre, you know, brings people on a show, gets him drunk, and, like, tortures his guests, basically. So I think Eric, uh, Eric Balfour, like, really goes off on him in the video, and I think it actually is hilarious. I'll put a link to that one in the show notes, too, so you guys can check that out if you haven't already. Um, and then R. Lee Ermey, uh, the drill sergeant from Full Metal Jacket, is in this movie. You know, nominated for, I'm pretty sure, a Golden Globe for, like, Best Supporting Actor for Full Metal Jacket is in this movie. Plays a pretty decently big part. Um... But yeah, so like Eric Balfour and Jessica Biel are a couple, and they're in the front seat. You know, they're obviously like Texas kids. Eric Balfour, you know, looking kind of sweaty, wearing a hat, wearing a, like a mechanic shirt that says his name on it, as if he just got off work. But I don't think he did. Um, and then there's you know Justin or Jonathan Tucker who plays Morgan the nerd. He's wearing, a, like, a New York University t-shirt. Uh, there's Mike Vogel, who is, like, obviously just, like, a hick guy um, in, like, a wife beater in jeans. And then um, there's a girl. Um, Erica Learson plays, like, a girl that they just met at, in Mexico. Uh, and, she and, and she and Mike Vogel are, like, vigorously making out. Um, and, you know, when we meet them and people are trying to talk to them, they won't stop making out, which is, like... Uh, I don't know. I think that's a Michael Bayism right there. I think I noted that where like people just can't keep their hands off of each other, and they're just shown making out like just like in the backseat of a car with a bunch of people, as if people ever really do that. Um, so yeah, they're on their way to a Leonard Skinner concert, uh, and they're driving down this dirt road. Um, and there's like an offhand comment, like offhand conversation between like Kemper and Morgan. Kemper is um, Eric Balfour's character. Uh, Kemper, not a name. I don't know if that's his first name or a last name, but it's like not really anything. Um, so there's a conversation about how they have, they're coming back from Mexico, and I guess they have two pounds of weed with them in a car. And they're transporting it across the border to sell it. And that's, of course, like, I don't know, I think that's a Michael Bayism. Um, just like, it's because it, it's like, it's a plot point for no reason, really. Um, I mean, it plays, like, a little bit of a role, but, like, I don't know, Michael Bay, I think, is obsessed with weed or something, because, like, in Friday the 13th, the remake, in the beginning, they're, like, they're by Camp Crystal Lake because they're trying to find an outcrop of weed, so I think Michael Bay, again, is, like, sex, drugs, rock and roll, basically, and I know people are gonna be like, well, Michael Bay didn't write this movie, but, like, if you think Michael Bay didn't have a hand in writing this movie, um, or, like, I don't know, maybe it's just the general crowd of people who are making this movie, which are, like, Hollywood music video guys like Michael Bay is, I think, um, you know, you can definitely see that Michael Bay's, um, fingerprints are all over this script in this movie. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but yeah, so, like, they pick up a drifter girl along the way, um, which is something that I guess they did back in the 70s a lot. I don't know, did people pick up hitchhikers a lot in the 70s? Because, I mean, now, I think that would never occur. Picking up uh, drifters is, like, a pretty insane thing to do. Like, if not this movie, then also, like, that movie, The Hitcher, I think, just taught people, just, hey, don't pick up hitchhikers. You know what I mean? Maybe don't. One of the worst ideas you can have. Pick up a random stranger. Um, so they pick up a drifter girl, and she seems, like, delirious and she's just walking aimlessly and they have to like pick her up and guide her 
into the van because they think Jessica Biel I guess is like some white knight and she's like oh no stop she could be in trouble so they pick her up and they put her in the van and she's like just she keeps mumbling about how she needs to get away and how she needs to go home and they ask her her name and then which it's funny it's very abrupt they are like they're like hey hey sweetie what's your name and they're and she's like they're all dead they're all dead all my family and friends are dead and it's just like obviously like whoa this girl is messed up <laughs> um but the drifter like sees that they're trying to that they're like going cuz like they passed her like she was walking the opposite way and that they were driving so they get her in the car and they keep driving the way they are which is the way the girl was coming from and she sees that they're driving back the way she came and she like flips out and she tries to grab the steering wheel um, from Kemper and they like shove her away and they're like whoa easy relax girl and then the girl is talking about well she's like oh you're going the wrong way we're all gonna die we're all gonna die and then the girl she takes a gun out of her vagina right this is this occurs in this movie um, the girl takes a gun out of her vagina like a a snub nosed pistol that was hidden in her vagina. I don't know about the science behind that. I'm not a doctor. Seems like that is impossible. But she takes a gun out of her vagina. And then she puts it into her mouth. And then she blows her head off. Like the like by the way, this movie's been on my, my TV screen for like seven minutes or something. This movie does not pull its punches. Not even a little bit. This movie goes you know what i mean and then there's this like everyone's screaming their heads off and there's this really cool shot where like the camera like focuses on the people in the front seat like eric balfour and jessica biel and it like pans back to show the reactions of the other characters and it pans back like through the hole in the back of the girl's skull and then her head falls over and then it keeps going back through like the hole in the back windshield and it's just a pretty neat shot overall um And then there's a cool shot of, like, the girl with the, like, smoke from the gun coming out of her mouth. It's pretty cool. There's some pretty cool shots. It's like, this movie, this movie has style, you know? It's shot beautifully by, you know, a cinematographer that knows what they're doing. Obviously, this movie is stylish. Um, so then the people that, you know, the occupants of the van, like, our gang that we're following, they get out, and they're screaming, and, you know, one of the girls vomits. Um... And they want to call the police, but they realize they can't because of all of the weed that they have. By the way, the weed is stored inside of a pinata. Just, I'm sorry, man. This movie has some really dumb elements, almost. If I, I mean, as much as I like this movie, like the weed being a the weed being there, the weed being in a pinata, the girl pulling a gun out of her vagina. They said, let's just do whatever we can to make this movie shocking and nonsensical. Um, not to disparage, please don't get me wrong, I love this movie. Um, it's so fun. But especially in like the early parts, like this movie is like bananas. Um, uh, so like, they're talking about how they need to get rid of the weed so they can call the cops. And Jessica Beale is like all, her name is Aaron, by the way. And she's like all mad about, why did you buy all that weed? What are you doing, Kemper? That's so irresponsible. And he's like, oh baby, I bought it for us. I bought, I bought it so we could start a new life. By the way, I don't think two pounds of marijuana is going to help you start a new life. I don't know how much money two pounds of marijuana is worth, you know. I don't really, I'm not really involved in those kind of markets. But, like, I don't think you're going to be able to buy a house off of the money you get from selling two pounds of weed. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, also Jessica Beale is, like, is, like, super good looking. She's way too good for Alec, Eric Balfour, like... He is like this sweaty guy with like a little mustache and like a little beard. Um, and he dresses like he's a mechanic or something. But he's obviously not. Um, and the, he, she's just way too good for him. Um, as far as a couple casting goes, it's a little bit of a mismatch. Um, so they dispose of the weed so that they can find a phone and call the cops. You know, because it's the 70s. You have to find a phone. And there's actually this scene of Eric Balfour. He takes the pinata of full of weed and he just throws it in the field. And it's like, he's like, I'm choosing the weed. I'm choosing you over the weed, Jessica Biel. You're so important to me. We gotta, we, you know, if you want me to get rid of the weed, I'll do it. Because he's Eric Balfour. Um, so, but it's funny because, like, the girl, Pepper, played by 
Erica Learson is like, yeah, I'm not getting back in that van. There's no way I'm getting back in that van. And then the next shot is literally the van driving away. So I think that's pretty, that's kind of funny. Um, but so like the dead girl is still in the van in the exact same position. And they just threw like newspapers over to cover her up. Um, But yeah, quick note, the facial hair on all these men, like I said about Eric Balfour, the facial hair on all these men is, is tough to handle. It's not great looking. Um, like, Jonathan Tucker has like these horrible little sideburns and like a little mustache. Eric Balfour has like a little mustache and like a little pharaoh beard. And then like Mike Vogel sort of has like a beard, like he has like five o'clock shadow. He's like the best looking, but like these men are uh, uh, not, a, not, a, not a very, like they make them look 70s Texan is what I mean. They make them look not that great. Like, these are pretty attractive men that they make look pretty bad. Um, so they're driving, and then they, they pull up to this gas station, right? Uh, and they go into the gas station. They're like, hey, we need to use your phone to call the sheriff. And, like, something's obviously up with this 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 gas station. Because, first of all, it has a full meat counter. Uh, and I understand it's like a meat packing industry town. But there's, like, pig heads in this counter. Everything's covered in flies. And, like... Obviously, something's something's fucky about this. You know what I mean? And this lady is obviously very bl too blasé and casual about these people having a dead body in their car and all these flies. Like, obviously, you know from minute one, especially if you know anything about this franchise, that this lady's involved somehow. Uh, so they they the, these the, these people call the shit. This woman calls the sheriff. And she tells them, she's like, okay, the sheriff will meet you at the old at the old Crawford Mill. And, of course, Eric Balfour's like, what are you even talking about? Why can't he just meet us right here and come get the body? And she said, well, he's two hours away, so he wants you to go and meet them if you can. And, of course, Eric Balfour, this is pretty, this is, I don't know, this is good because, like, he's acting reasonable. He's like, yeah, that's insane. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but that's, like, the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I don't want to drive, you know, a second longer with this dead body in my car. And she's like, well, if you want to meet the sheriff, you got to go to the Crawford Mill. Obviously, something's up here. That is a huge red flag. But I guess they really want the body out of the car. And and Eric Balfour is like, yeah, I guess we really got to do this stuff so I can appease Jessica Beale because she's a white knight and cares about a lot about this dead girl. Um so then they drive off and they pull into this seedy, rusty looking mill where obviously there's no sheriff. No one's there. By the way, they shot this in Texas and like, I'm sorry, but they do a good job of making Texas look really dirty and seedy and gross and rusty. You know what I mean? Everything looks like it's covered in an inch of dust and rust and looks like it's been stagnant for 20 years. This old mill, incredibly creepy looking. Yet there's like all this farm equipment and broken down cars and it's just scary. Like, it looks like the hills have eyes or something. It's terrifying. Um, but yeah, the Texas backdrop is, like, just really good, I think. I think Marcus Nispel wanted to film it in California, and Michael Bay was like, no, we should film it in Texas. I filmed a lot of stuff in Texas, and it'll be good. And he was right. I think this was really good, a really good choice. Um, so they get to this mill, but no one's there. And, like, Balfour wants to leave the body. And Vogel... Like, Mike Vogel, whose name is Andy, and Morgan, like, they vote to just dump the body. But Jessica Biel throws, like, a fit, of course, because she's, like, a good person, obviously. But, like, in these kind of movies, if you're a good person, you die. And I think there's a certain line where it's like, oh, hey, being a good person and wanting to respect this random dead body is getting into, into these really seedy, weird, uncomfortable situations where we're, we might be in danger. Like, this whole situation seems weird, and, like, I guess Jessica Biel's a nice lady and all in this movie, but it's just like, hey man, at, at, one, at a certain point you gotta cut your losses. Because no offense to Jessica Biel, you got all your fucking friends killed. Like, if you had been like, oh hey, that's fine, let's just leave the body and go. And they would have left, all of these people would have survived. Like, you can't just be nice to a fault. Um, but yeah, so like, she guilts them into staying, and then they, they're like, okay, well we'll just stay until the, the sheriff comes up. Um, so uh, Jessica Biel goes off, and, and she explores this mill. Uh, and by the way, quick note, I don't really care about this stuff. I try to keep it professional, and I respect women. But Jessica Biel's body is, like, insane. And I guess that's not even disrespectful to say. Because, I mean, she probably works hard on it. She probably has personal trainers, and she probably wants it to look good. And believe me, Jessica Biel looks phenomenal in this movie. She has, like, abs, and she's wearing, like, 
low rise like boot cut jeans and like a white tank top that she has tied off and she looks phenomenal i will just say that and i won't say anything more about it because i don't you know i don't mean to objectify her in any way because she's a good actor she's an okay person um much more successful than i am probably pretty smart um decently good in this movie Sucks that she's anti-vax, but yeah, her body is 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 uh, ridiculous, um, and it's really there's a lot of gratuitous body shots of her in this scene, of course, because it's a Michael Bay movie, um, so it's like it'd be it'd be almost ridiculous to like not not say or something about it. But they come across like a little boy in the movie, and he's played by that kid from The Ring, and The Ring Two, like Naomi Watts' child in those movies who was also in Drill Bit Taylor. And, you know, it's funny enough, he's actually a practicing lawyer now. Went to Harvard Law School, which is interesting. Um, but, yeah, come across this dirty little toothless hick boy who's, you know, I mean, like, this kid's just squatting in this mill. Don't don't befriend this kid. Get, you get the hell out of there. If I saw a kid like that in a mill, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be gone. But, of course, Jessica Peel's like, oh, my gosh, are you okay? Where are your parents? And, of course, this kid's, like, surrounded by weird statues made of bone and, like, these creepy drawings and they're still like oh my gosh are you okay what's going on do you live here it's just like no man this kid is a psycho you gotta get out of here and he's uh, no offense he's obviously connected to what's going on in this town um so the boy they asked the boy they said hey have you seen the sheriff and he's like actually the sheriff lives right up the hill and he's up there drunk so if you want the sheriff you gotta go up the hill like Come on, man. Obviously, you guys are getting to run around. If they say, hey, the sheriff's going to come to the mill, and then you get to the mill, the sheriff's not there. Oh, and you're not going to go to the sheriff's house now? Like, I'm sorry. You don't even know this person. Just leave the, leave the spot. Leave the body. I guess you couldn't leave the body because then the movie would end. But, like, still. This is absurd at this point. I would, like, I personally would be like, I'd be like, all right, I can't. I got to discard these niceties because I'm having to go too many places. You know what I mean? So... Kemper and Aaron, they they walk up the hill to this house, and this is a beautiful giant house. It almost looks computer generated. The fact that this house looks so good, and it's like in this field of grass. It looks really cool, kind of haunting. Again, the Texas backdrop, cinematography, of this movie is very good, very stylish. Um, so, but they don't find the sheriff. Of course, they find this legless, gross Texan man uh, with a mangy dog in his lap, and he's like, "Well, the sheriff's not here." Oh my gosh. The sheriff's not here, he's not there, he's not anywhere. Cut your losses, get out of here. Um, but he's like, oh, you can use my phone to call the sheriff. And Jessica Biel's like, okay, I'll come in and use that, I'll come in and use your phone. And the guy, of course, makes Eric Balfour wait outside, which, of course, I would not have done. Like, I'd been like, yeah, I'm going to go with her into this scary house. Or not. We're both not going in. But, of course, they agree to split up for no reason. Um... So, so, so Jessica Biel calls the sheriff, seemingly has like a reasonable conversation with him, and the sheriff says he'll be there in 30 minutes. Um, But then, if you flash back to what's happening back at the mill, at the current moment, the sheriff is at the mill already, even though he said to Jessica Biel that he'd be there in 30 minutes. Now, they don't explain this, really. They don't necessarily, I don't know if that was a different sheriff she was talking to, or what happened, but they don't explain how the sheriff got there so fast. Or how the sheriff was on the phone with her while also simultaneously driving to the mill. Because, like, cell phones don't exist. So, I don't know. They don't really explain that. It's, it, I mean, it, it does create, like, a creepy atmosphere because it's just like, oh, he's there earlier than he said he was. Who was she talking to? Doesn't really, is not really follow through on. Um, but the sheriff, of course, is played by Arlie Ermey. And he, he delivers. He's absolutely bananas in this movie. I mean, of course, he's like the biggest Michael Bayism of all because his presence in this movie is so silly. Um, but yeah, um, and he's just like, he's just like, oh, here, I'm here to help you guys. Let me look at the body. But of course, he's also being like a drill sergeant about it. And he's calling them fucking pussies. And he's just like uh, spitting dip everywhere. And he's making offhanded weird comments. Um, so Beale is like, she hangs the phone back at the house. And then the old man's like, oh, help me, help me. And this old man has somehow fallen out of his chair. And he needs Jessica Beale's help. 
and then like Jessica Biel is trying to like lift this man off the floor into his wheelchair and of course she's not gonna be able to do it this old man weighs more than her and it's a really uncomfortable angle and it's like I think he's just trying to distract her and also he's like copping feels on her butt the entire time another Michael Bayism also it does create like a atmosphere and like an attitude of oh these guys are creepy and gross um So Balfour, like, is alone, and he, like, re-enters the house because Beale's not coming out, because she's being distracted by this old man. Um, so Balfour re-enters the house, only to be hit on the back of the head with a hammer and dragged away by Leatherface. So I have a distinct feeling that we're not going to see Balfour again. Um, so back at the mill, Arlie, uh, Arlie Army, like, is rapping, is, like, having the boys, like, Morgan and Andy, like take the body out and wrap the body in saran wrap he lit he lit he legitimately wraps the body in saran wrap and no one and no one thinks anything of it they're like oh this is fine this is how police uh, policemen operate honey no there's a coroner an ambulance comes they don't put the body in saran wrap but yeah arlie emery ermy whatever you want to call him is making like disgusting comments about this girl like, oh, what, what did you do to this girl? Did you guys have fun with her? She feels wet down here. And he's, like, touching her vagina. It's really fucking, it's really gross. Um, but, of course, it's like they're trying to create, like, a seedy Texas underbelly that is not a, you know, it's not what it seems. And they're doing a good job, but also it's a little Michael Bay. Um, and then they put the, the girl in the trunk of sheriff the sheriff's car, and people are like, no one is like, hey, this seems weird, right? Uh, no one is like that. Uh, but then we, we cut back to the house and we see Leatherface in his shop in the basement. And, like, the shop, I think, is one of the most beautifully done things in the movie. Because, like, there's, like, pipes leaking. There's water dripping on everything. Everything looks, like, wet and slimy. And there's, like, heads and hands and jars. And there's, like, hooks and knives and just chainsaws everywhere. Um, his layer is, like, so dark and damp. And there's bloody hooks and there's, like, a severed ear. And then it folk there's like it pans over and there's like some face of like some fat nerd person with like glasses and long hair, uh, just a face. Um, and like, we see leather vases like cutting through and sewing up Kemper's body. So like, Balfour is dead, uh, and he's being cut into by Leatherface. Um, So at this point, Beale um, has like is like has like left the house, and she's like, "Oh, I don't know where Kemper is. He must have gone back to the camp." So then she goes back to the camp with everyone else. And I don't know why I'm calling it the camp. It's the Crawford Mill. And then they're like, "She's like, oh, where's where's Kemper? We have to look for him. Why is he not here? I thought he'd be here." And they're like, "Oh, we thought he was with you." But then they're like, they hear a horn go off, and there's like a lot of dilapidated, destroyed cars that are like rusted out and junk and it's like a junkyard kind of at this mill they're like they hear a horn go off and they like they like they follow the sound of the horn i guess thinking that it's kemper but then they find like a like a stick wedged in to a car seat like making it push the the horn so they were obviously drawn to this area for some reason and they come across some really gross, weird items in this junkyard that's obviously also kind of a graveyard. They come across, like, a, a person's retainer with teeth still in it. And obviously they freak out. It's disgusting. Um, and then they also encounter a glass jar with, like, a mysterious liquid in it. And inside the mysterious liquid, there's a picture of the drifter girl and her family. Like, I don't know what this jar is, some sort of weird trophy, but they found it. And obviously something's going on. This is beyond crazy. People are disappearing. Um, I think this is like where they're like, okay, we gotta get the, the hell out of here right now. Uh, also, it, it, during the Leatherface scene, he like puts Eric Balfour's body in a bathtub and like hoists him up, and out of the out of his pocket falls like a diamond ring. So that's like a real bummer that like he was gonna propose to Jessica Biel, I guess but is now dead and can't. So that's a bummer. Also, they've been talking about how Jessica Peel really wanted to get married, like, on the initial car ride in. So, like, Leatherface just is, like, looking at this ring, and it's like, oh, man. That's, uh, eh, it's disappointing. Um, 
but yeah, so and so Andy and Aaron go back to the house to look for Kemper. Um, and like Aaron distracts the legless old man so that Andy can sneak inside and look for Kemper. But then Andy makes a bunch of noise, knocks some stuff over, and um, they are discovered. And then the old man summons Leatherface by slamming like his cane into the ground, and then Leatherface just like engages them. He like slams through a door, and you know he gives chase. And um, Aaron is like running ahead of Andy, and then Andy. This is like probably one of the coolest scenes in the movie, actually. And it's like a scene I va I distinctly remember from my first watch of this movie, where Andy is running through this like the backyard, and there's white sheets hung up everywhere, and he's like running through the sheets. And then Leatherface comes out of nowhere with his chainsaw, and then just, like, one fell swoop, like, cuts his leg off at the knee. So, like, the blood, like, spurts all over the white sheets, and, like, Andy falls to the ground, and you see his severed leg. It's such a cool scene, and it's, like, really well done. Also, like, Leatherface is, like, wieldy as hell in this one. In, like, the old one, if you watch, he's kind of slow and jerky, and he doesn't really swing. I mean, he swings his chainsaw around, but, like... He, also in that movie he's chasing Sally Hardesty for a million years and he's so sl he's like so much slower than her and he like doesn't even come close to hitting her really wants at all the chainsaw but in this movie Leatherface said yeah I have this chainsaw and I'm gonna use it and he just ch chops this dude's legs right off so and then he drags Andy back inside and he brings him downstairs kicking and screaming um, and you see Andy and he's he, Andy's like trying to grasp on the walls to like stop from being dragged and like his fingernails come off in the wall and it's like that's like from the police um voiceover tape earlier that's the where the fingernails came from i guess um but yeah and then um andy is like hung on a meat hook like he's put up on a meat hook and it's just like it like you know pierces through his back and he's like screaming um and that's just like it's like an homage to like the girl character who's hung on a meat hook in the first movie um but this one it's much more affecting i think because in the original like there's like no like wet schlunk sound schlunk, like as the hook goes through it's actually virtually silent in the first one for whatever reason um which i think so i think this one was much more effective um and then like leatherface like takes salt and he like rubs it into andy's wound and he, like, then wraps it up and, like, ties it off because he wants to keep Andy alive. And, gosh, it's uh, brutal and kind of gruesome to watch. Um, but, yeah, so meanwhile, the sheriff um, has returned to the, the campsite. And, like, Aaron and Morgan and Pepper are there. And then the sheriff discovers the weed. And he makes them all get on the ground. And he's, like, shooting bullets at their head to scare them. And it's, like... There's some parallels between this behavior, this crazy police behavior um, in the 70s by this, like, hick, lunatic, inbred guy and the way police generally behave in today's day and age. But anyway, uh, I don't want to get too politically charged here. Um, but yeah, so, like, the sheriff has, like, these kids, uh, like, laying down on the ground at their, at, like, his mercy. And he's got a gun pointed at him all over weed, by the way. Um, and, like... Jessica Biel is actually acting her ass off in the scene because she's like snotty and wet around the mouth and there's like a spit trail from going from her in the dirt and it's like disgusting obviously but like you know you could tell that she's scared um oh, and then back at the house you see Leatherface and he's shown sewing together a Kemper face mask so he's making like he has removed Kemper's face and he's like sewing a mask of it and it's so disgusting and then he then removes his own mask i guess to put on the kemper mask and you see that he's like really deformed he has like no nose like all of all the mort and he's like and it's like his face is all messed up and this is actually like the only movie i think where you see leatherface's face uh, underneath the mask so then uh if i can be honest there's this stupid scene where the sheriff makes morgan go in the truck and he like, he's like, let me, show me what happened to that girl. Sit exactly where she uh, was, put this gun in your mouth, um, and recreate the suicide for me. And he's, like, crying. And it's really unpleasant, and I don't really think it adds anything to the movie, and it's just kind of dumb. Um, and, of course, like, the sheriff's like, put this gun in your mouth. And then, like, Morgan is like, ah-ha-ha, now I have a gun, and I'll kill you. But, of course, the gun isn't loaded. Um, 
And he takes, he beats Morgan up and he takes him away in his car. And there's actually this really funny scene where the sheriff is driving Morgan. Um, and he's talking to him and he's like, what are you guys doing out here anyway? He's like, we were going to see a Leonard Skinner concert. And our like Arlie Ermy is like, hell, I like Skinner. We got something in common. And I'm like, yeah, man, everybody likes Skinner. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, so like he like beats up Morgan pretty bad and like takes him to the house. Leaving Aaron um, and Pepper at the car. So you're thinking, why would the sheriff leave these two people at this car that they have keys to? Um, but for some reason, they can't get the car started. And Jessica Beale uh, and manages to hotwire the car, a talent she picked up in juvie, I guess. There's like a throwaway comment about it. Uh, they get the car started and they start driving away only for the freaking wheel to fall off. It's like actually almost comical. Um, and then, of course, Leatherface abounds uh, and they're attacked by him and he saws through the roof of the van and then they scramble out and then he, uh, he cuts Pepper across the back before finally cutting her in half. So Pepper, gone. Um, even though you don't see it, you just see him kind of swing the blade down at her midsection. But, you know, she's dead. Um, and then, oh, man, this is this is a pretty crazy scene, too, because, like, you see Leatherface cut Pepper in half from the back. And then he turns around and looks at Aaron, and he's wearing Kemper's face as the mask. And, gosh, it's so creepy. It's, like, made my skin crawl. And, of course, Jessica Biel is horrified. Um... But yeah, so like, um, so Beale runs away, um, and she, she finds, like, comes across this trailer, and there's, like, these local yokels in there who are obviously, like, dirty Texas people, um, uh, and they're, like, trying, they're, like, here, drink some tea, honey, drink some tea, calm down, there's no one out there, there's no one chasing you, it's fine, and it's, like, they're being obviously really blasé and weird, just like everyone in this is in this whole town, because they're involved, um, and they start talking to her about Leatherface and how they... They know who he is and how he has all these skin defects and deformities. And they're like, oh, that poor boy. And they're being way too sympathetic to a murderer for Jessica Biel to obviously not get the hell out of there. Um, and this, these ladies are both, like, dirty and weird and gross. And it seems cultish. Like, their attitude is really weird and light about something that's so serious. Um, and then Jessica Biel noticed that there's, like, a picture collage on the wall that reveals the drifter girl and her family... And the drifter girl's holding a baby. And that baby is in the next room crying. So Jessica Beale's like, hey, that's not your baby. You must have killed the mother, like the, like the people who, like you, like the, I've encountered the mother of this baby. And you must have killed her entire family. So you must be in on it. But of course, the tea that Jessica Beale drank was drugged and she's knocked out. Um, and then, you know, you cut back to the, the house and the sheriff, the gas station lady, those two ladies from the trailer, they're all revealed to be in on it and part of this family. Um, and then Beale is locked in the basement. Um, in Leatherface's lair. And there's just like... Like, it's, it's kind of funny because like, there's like a foot of water on the ground in this lair, by the way. And I know it's supposed to drive home. They're like, oh, Leatherface is like not a human being. He lives in like a sub basement that's like wet and grimy and gross almost like a cave because he's like an animal but it's like can you imagine being leatherface and having to trudge through like a foot of water you know you're making your masks you're sewing people up you're trying to get work done and you're just trudging through water all the time and everything's always wet like imagine leatherface being like ugh guys we really need to get a sub pump down here or something like this is getting a bit ridiculous like i know like you guys like my masks and you like give me people to kill but i can't i can't work in these conditions i just like to think of leatherface having to like be annoyed because like there's no way it doesn't bother him the fact that there's like so much water everywhere you know what i mean i know it contributes to the overall mood and the aura and it like makes you think like oh he's an animal but like he's he's gotta be like annoyed by that because it really has to hinder his ability to make his masks um but jessica beale comes across andy and andy is still hung on this meat hook and his arms draw stretch he looks like a like a crucified jesus christ i don't know if they did that on purpose or not but um so, um, and Andy's hung over underneath the piano, and his toes are, like, hitting buttons on the piano, and it actually is, like, really creepy and kind of it's eerie and scary. Uh, and she tries to get him down, she tries to grab his waist and, like, hoist him off the hook, but she can't do it. 
And like this is like another really I think affecting well made scene, um, because Andy is like obviously an incredible amount of pain, uh, but he can't he just can't die, and he's like listen man can you please kill me, like if you can't get me down, please kill me. And my misery and she's like she like doesn't want to do it and he's like no please please please, and then she picks up a knife and like she stabs him in the chest. And, like, she's, like, wailing and crying, like, at Andy's feet. And, like, his arms go limp and they hang at his side. And then there's, like, just blood pouring down on her. And it actually is, like, a really kind of beautifully made, well-done scene. Because, like, there's, like, actually kind of a lot of emotion in it, I think. Um, so then she's wandering around the basement. And then she encounters Morgan tied up in a bathtub of seemingly poop. I don't know. It's, like, there's, like, brown, gross, chunky water. Um... And she's like, Morgan, get up. And she like, he's like tied up. And she's like, we gotta get the heck out of here somehow. But then, lo and behold, they're rescued by this child. Whose name is Jedediah that they encountered earlier. And he's like, here, listen, if you come this way, I can help you get out of here. And it's shown already that like Jedediah is like... Kind of ostracized by this family for some reason. Maybe because he's young. Or he's like the least inbred. But like, he's like, um, he's like... He's, like, the, the newest generation, and they're, like, and he, like, they won't, like, they're, like, no, you can't come and eat inside with us. We don't want you in here. So he's, like, ostracized, and he's, like, on these people's side, kind of, maybe because they showed him compassion earlier, but he, like, helps lead them out. But, like, of course, Leatherface is hot on their trail, um, but then Leatherface's chainsaw, like, stalls, allowing them to momentarily escape. Uh, also, like, just to, just, just to make a note of it, there's so much chainsaw noise in this movie. Like, maybe... That's the reason people don't like these movies is because, like, the chainsaw is such a loud and, like, annoying murder weapon. Like, a knife or, like, a gun or, like, an axe. Like, you just, there's no noise. But there's, like, so much rah, 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 chainsaw noise in this movie. It actually almost does become, like, irritating after a while. Especially in this last, like, 20, 30 minutes of the movie where he's carrying around the chainsaw and chasing people for the, in, in the, the entire duration of the movie. Um... But yeah, so like, they're chased into this other little guest house on this property. Which, by the way, these people have quite the spread. Like, it's like they have like a far, a just beautiful big farmhouse. Like a barn in the back. Crawford Mill is like right there. They have this little guest house. And like, there's a slaughterhouse is like right there. These people have quite a spread. They have like, it's like a dilapidated mansion, but it's like a mansion. This is like a, this is like a, this is like a $200,000 property or something. But yeah, and then there's like, uh, there's like plenty of scenes of Morgan and Jessica Biel hiding from the killer in various places, which, I mean, I love horror movies, but I think hiding from the killer is like such a boring, lame thing to have your characters do, because uh, it's so visually unappealing. Um, and it's like been so tried out, like, I know he's going to find you. Like, I've never seen hiding just work. You know what I mean? It's like, it always, ha it's like you hide, and then you seemingly, he, oh, he walked away, and then he's right there, and it's just like, oh, it just bores me so much. Um, like, I think, what did I write? I wrote, they hide from Leatherface, BORING, in all caps, HATE IT, because I really do. Um, but of course, they think he's left, but then, uh, and this is actually pretty cool, he like, breaks through, like, he punches through the wood wall, and then he like, grabs her and pulls her back, which is like, I think maybe one of the first times I've ever seen this occur in a movie. Uh, and he drags Beale away. But Morgan, who's still like, who's still tied up, like he charges Leatherface and he knocks the chainsaw away. And like while he's struggling with Leatherface, the chainsaw like falls on the ground and it's like whirring and spitting like right by Jessica Beale's face. So that's actually a pretty, pretty neat scene because you're like, oh shit, is Jessica Beale just gonna die anyway? Um, but Morgan is like, I don't know, because he's, you know, he's tiny. He's like 5'4", maybe. And Leatherface is like 7 feet tall. Played by Andrew uh, Brynarski, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. Because um, he played, he was in Street Fighter, and he also played text, uh, the Leatherface in, in Text Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning, too. So, um, I'd, I'd have to see what he ranks in terms of Leatherface portrayals. Uh, I'll get back to you about that the next episode. Um, but yeah, so Morgan is obviously overpowered. He's outmatched. He's literally tied up. So Leatherface takes him, 
lifts him up and hangs him from a chandelier. So Morgan is like hanging by his arms, he's tied up, and then Leatherface picks up the chainsaw and just cuts right through him. Like cuts like from dick to chest, just cuts him in half. And like obviously Morgan is dead. And that's a pretty cool kill. Maybe my favorite in the movie. Um, and of course it would be great if they showed more, but I don't think they can show a lot of guts if they, you know, the Motion Picture Association of America really kind of nerfs movies like this. Um, so Leatherface, of course, gives chase to Jessica Biel. And there's actually a really cool scene where, and I know I describe all these scenes as cool, and I need to stop doing that. I'm sorry, I need to expand my vocabulary. Um, but Leatherface, like, gives chase to Jessica Biel, and, like, he's running through, like, a barbed wire fence, and he's, like, ducking through it, and he trips and falls. And he accidentally chainsaws his own leg a little bit, which is, like, an homage to the original, because Leatherface did that in the original, too. So I think that's cool. Um... But even though he, even though he cuts his leg, he still makes pretty good time, because he catches up to Jessica Biel at this meat pack, meat packing plant. Like he falls on the ground and he's like writhing in pain. But then of course the next second he's right there. Um, and of course there's a scene where Jessica Biel is like hiding again, and like Leatherface reaches underneath of like a stall or whatever, and she's like kicking at him. And isn't it funny how like there's always these scenes in horror movies where like the killer is coming up from underneath and like the the, fem, the like the the final girl or guy or whatever is like kicking and like for some reason kicking is like it's like a it's like a serial killer or a slasher's like Achilles heel like listen man you're like seven feet tall your arms are like as big as tree trunks just grab her leg break her leg and I actually saw Scream last night the new one that they uh, that they came out with, and like I wouldn't want to spoil anything. It was lovely. It was terrific. I loved it. Um, but there's a scene where like, and it's the very beginning of the movie. There's a scene that I thought was really cool because like, I had just been thinking about this kicking thing, and like, there's a scene where Jenna Ortega is like kicking at Ghostface, and he just like steps to the side and steps on her and breaks her leg, and I'm just like, yeah, exactly. Kicking it should not be this effective. I don't know. Just grab the leg. <laughs> but they're just unable to grab the leg, so Jessica Biel of course gets away. Um, and of course, there's this really, there's actually this pretty um, impressive looking scene and pretty, um, I don't know, it just really captures like the gross Texas meatpacking plant aura where she's like, she's like hiding and running through this like cold room where they have all these giant cow carcasses hung, you know, how like Rocky used to beat up to train. Um, so she's hiding in this room. Uh, and of course, Leatherface, like he knows his way about the meatpacking industry because he's He's not, he lives in a meatpacking town, damn it. And he, like, he starts the belts, and then the meats move, and it, like, knocks Jessica Biel down, and she screams, and then he knows her location. So he's on her. Uh, and then for some reason, Leatherface turns on sprinklers. Uh, and I think this is literally just... just, like, a, a vehicle to expose Jessica Biel's boobs in a wet t-shirt contest-esque way. Like, literally, in the lair, in this scene, it's raining outside. Like, they just want Jessica Biel to be in a wet, white t-shirt. And that's a Michael Bay thing. That's a huge Michael Bayism of this movie. Is they're like, well, Jessica Biel got a great body. We're going to show it off in spades. Uh, you're going to be wet for so much of this movie for no reason. Just so we can see what's under your shirt. And it's kind of gross. But like, I mean, also she looks, she does look good. So mm -hmm. there's that as well. Um, but like, so Jessica Biel is like running and she hides in this locker room. And she actually, you know, because she's smart and she's a final girl, she has wit. That's the reason she survived this long. So even though at the beginning of the movie she was acting real dumb. Um, so she does this thing where she takes a piglet, because there's like live pigs and animals in this in this meatpacking plant. And she takes a piglet and she hides it in this locker. So it's like moving around making noise in this locker. And she hides in the opposite locker. So then when Leatherface, like, opens the locker to get her it's just a piglet and then she jumps out and she literally with a cleaver cleaves off this man's hand this chainsaw arm like at like the whole forearm she just chop 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 and then Leatherface's arm just falls to the ground and I'm just like damn she really just incapacitated this dude so and it's like and then the chainsaw like falls to the ground and it's like spinning and whirring in like a pool of Leatherface's blood and it's like it's very well done um this movie Especially in these last, like, 30 minutes. is like, gangbusters. It's just, like, they have a lot of really, really, um, just, like, just, like, neat-looking scenes that I'm like, man, that's awesome. Um, 
so then Leatherface, like, he tries to get up, but he's, like, losing so much blood, and he just sits down defeated. And you think, oh, maybe Leatherface is just, he's defeated now. That's cool. Um, so then Beale is, like, she makes her way to the main road, and she gets picked up by a semi-truck. Um, but then the guy, of course, he starts going the wrong way, because he's going back to where she came from, and she's like, oh, no, 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 you're going the wrong way. I just want to go home, please. And she, like, struggles to take the wheel, because she's just, like, the, the hitchhiker from the first movie, from, like, the beginning of the movie. She literally says, like, I just want to go home, just like the girl was muttering, muttering about earlier. So then, you know, she's grabbing at the wheel, and they almost get into an accident. The guy pulls over at the gas station from earlier. And Jessica Biel's like, oh, no, we, we can't do that. So, like, the truck driver goes inside, and it's like, hey, man, you need to call the police. This girl out here is freaking out. And she's like, almost made me crash my truck. So, like, while this guy's distracting them, Beal... And this is, like, oh, actually almost out of left field. It's so clever and badass. Um, she, like, sneaks inside the diner, steals that baby from earlier. I know you kind of forgotten about the baby, but she wants to save this baby because she's a good person, remember? Uh, she steals the baby, and then she hot wires the sheriff's car while the sheriff is looking inside of the semi-truck. And then she she successfully hot wires the car and then just, just runs Sheriff Hoyt down. And she, like, runs him over, backs up over him, runs him over again. This dude is definitely dead. And of course, this is like an homage to like the first film because she's getting away, just like Sally Hardesty did at the beginning one, or in like the 1974 one. Um, and there's this actually, there's this funny scene after the sheriff dies where you just see his hat like spinning and then fall in the middle of the road, like like his 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 swan song or something. Like, oh, remember his hat? Now that it's off his head, that's how you know he's really dead, or whatever. It's, like, actually funny. I laughed a little bit at it. Um, so then she's driving away, but of course Leatherface has to come back and do one last swing, and he swipes the side of the car and sparks fly up, and then, like, you know, he's obviously missing an arm, and he just stares after her as she drives away with the baby. So then, um, you know, in, in this the end of the movie, the screen goes back to the crime scene footage from earlier where, like, the cops are exploring the basement. And then they hear a noise, and they're attacked by Leatherface. And he kills both those cops. And that's in, like, present day. So then, like, another, the voiceover comes over and is like, oh, yeah, the crime scene, I guess, was not secure. And both those officers were killed. And during the filming, while the camera was hitting the ground, we managed to get these images of Thomas Hewitt, known as Leatherface. And these are the only images that we have ever seen. The investigation is still going. And then the, just the movie fades to black and it's over. So yeah, that's the movie. Um, painstakingly uh, explained to you. Uh, but it's just like, man, like this movie, like it's a little slow in the middle. And it's like, it gets off to a, a rocky start. Like you don't think this movie can be a good movie based on like the first like 10 minutes of it. Because of like how, how quickly it goes. Like, it doesn't, like, movies that usually take no time to develop like that usually are bad. But this movie really kind of turns into a movie with a lot of really, really interesting scenes and a lot of really legitimately good stuff in it. Like, I would say, like, the the kills, despite being nerfed, are, like, much more intense, I think, and, like, exciting. And listen, I don't know what that says about me. I don't know if it's just my generation and youths today. Like, they just need to be shocked. Like, nothing scares us anymore. They need intensity, we need blood, we need guts, we need, like, we need entertainment. And, like, shock, and, you know, it's just what we need, I think. But, like, the, and these kills, like, I, I think deliver that more than in the original, for sure. Um, like, the, the Morgan kill, where he hangs from the chandelier, and, like, cuts up through him, very cool. Very neat. And, like, the scene where, like, Andy gets his leg cut off, very nice. Masterfully done, I must say. Um, I think Jay Beale, of course, like is like the winner of this movie. I think she actually does like a really good job. I think this might have been one of the first movies she did. Yeah, I mean she's done some stuff that no one's ever. Yuli's Gold, like a bunch of stuff that no one's really you know talked about. But like, this was like one of the first movies. I think she was still doing Seventh Heaven during this time. But um. I think this was one of her first movies, and I think she does really well with it, I think. I think she's really good. Um, but, of course, like, the best, and, like, I like especially that scene with 
uh, where Andy, where she puts, where she like mercy kills Andy. I think that's a really great scene. And like, I think she's really in all of the great scenes that make this movie great. And it's like, even though at the beginning you're like, oh, she's just a dumb, nice girl. I think she turns into a really kind of badass final girl in the end of this movie. And she really impressed me. Um, and like, I guess like if you wanted to improve this movie, you could definitely like, have some better dialogue and take out some of the silly stuff um like i know michael bay and i don't mean to disparage michael bay so much i know i i know i, I know his, his work like it's his name's on the tip of my tongue this entire show but like i don't know like i know he brings movies to stuff and he brings a certain star power and there's probably a lot of the elements of this movie that i do like that he is responsible for but i just think he doesn't understand how to write like i know he has his myths all over this movie and i know a lot of it's probably scott kozar because I don't know if this guy knows how to write dialogue, per se. But, like, I don't know, better dialogue, maybe show some more of the graphic kills, maybe if they released, like, an unrated version. Because I know a lot of that stuff was probably shot. Um, maybe it would improve the movie a bit, but I honestly, I thought it was great. You know, I thought the Texas backdrop and the cinematography, how everything looks so, like, grainy and rusty and dusty um, and dry was, like, really, like, I, it sold it for me. And, like, the way Leatherface was, like, so greasy and grimy and wet and slimy and skeezy and just a lot of other adjectives was just really, really good. I mean, of course, Arlie Ermey is terrific. Um, Jessica Biel is great. Um, the cast, I mean, they're, like, they're, they're, like, attractive people made to look dirty and gross. And it really works, I think. And, like, there's some really genuinely creepy moments and some genuinely exciting um, shocking moments, and, like, I think the pace is really good. So I just think this movie has a lot to offer, you know? So, uh, of course, I'll finish it off by, um, maybe getting into some trivia, some production notes here, just really quick before I wrap it up. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so this was Marcus Nispel's directorial debut, um, he was actually initially, interesting enough, he was initially against the idea of remaking the film. And he actually referred to it as blasphemy to, like, remake a film that's, like, so perfect as the original. But, like, he was actually convinced by Daniel Pearl, the, the cinematographer of the original one, that, like, hey, I think you could really do this movie justice if you shot it. And I guess they had worked together on a lot of music videos. So, like, Daniel Pearl was like, listen, man, I worked on the original. I think if you did this, you would bring a lot to it. And he wanted to, I guess Pearl wanted to bookend his career with Texas Chainsaw Massacres, which is kind of cool. Um, of course, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but, like, as with the original and all these movies, they're loosely inspired by, like, the real-life crimes of Ed Gein uh, and how, like, he made nipple belts out of people and lamp shades out of skin and everything. Um, so, yeah, that's creepy. Doesn't that make this movie so creepy that it's inspired by true events, more or less? That, like, people actually do this kind of stuff? so creepy um, uh, I guess a cool thing is that like Scott Kozar um, he I guess like I don't know as much as the writing of this movie is problematic at times I think Scott Kozar had a good attitude about it because I read that like on Wikipedia so like you know I'm not I don't have any insider knowledge but like I guess he felt that, like, the, the new film shouldn't try to compete with the original, um, because, like, you know, it's one of the seminal works of the genre, and it couldn't be better, necessarily. You could only make it different. And I really think that, like, again, I know I've said it before, but, like, this movie is, like, the fact that they didn't, like, do, like, a, a Gus Van Zandt shot-for-shot shot remake, I think they, like, they took a good story and they brought the other good elements of horror to it. And I think that's just, um, I think that's really good, good work that they did. Uh, Andrew Brynarski, who played um, Leatherface, actually had been in Pearl Harbor, and he and Michael Bay had been friends, and I guess he approached Michael Bay at a Christmas party and asked him if he could play Leatherface, so that was pretty neat. I guess the filming, um, they filmed in Austin, and the filming lasted for 40 days.
and like of course there's many references to the original film like the hung on the meat hook and the John Larroquette voiceover um interestingly enough too this is a good one um um Brian Narski, who portrayed Leatherface did all of his own stunts and he was actually forced to wear a fat suit which increased his near 300 pounds to 420 pounds and the suits like heated up very quickly and was very heavy so the actor had to like make sure he was drinking fluids all the time and also I guess Leatherface's mask was silicone so like it was like so hard to breathe and could you imagine how hot that was like you're carrying around 420 pounds in like in like July in Austin, Texas. God, I can't believe that guy even lived. It's crazy. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm just going to finish up with some just additional trivia, courtesy of IMDb and other areas I found. Um, uh, Eric Learson, who, um, who played Pepper, actually, I guess, screamed so loudly during her... Um, screen test that people in other parts of the building called the police to report like that a woman was being attacked so I think that's interesting I mean like you know if you're auditioning for a movie like this you gotta have a good scream and I guess her scream really was that good um pretty stupid one here I guess on his final day of shooting Eric Balfour stripped down threw his wardrobe back to the crew and walked off the set only wearing a baseball cap so completely naked uh Eric Balfour Seems like the exact kind of guy that would be in a Michael Bay movie. Um, I don't know. I've seen him in stuff. Not a lot of stuff. I don't know if he's necessarily a very gifted actor, but he does seem like he has a lot of confidence. Um, so I, there's a scene with a possum in the movie where they think, they hear the noise in the Crawford Mill, and they come across a possum and before discovering the little boy Jedediah. And I guess they like they had to reshoot the scene with the possum like a million times. Because every scene that they shot with the possum, they just made it look cute. And they couldn't make it look scary or scared. It just looked adorable. Um, so that's funny. Uh, I guess in order to prepare for his role as Leatherface, Andrew Brynarski ate a diet of brisket and white bread uh, in order to get to nearly 300 pounds. Uh, this movie was banned in the Ukraine by the Ministry of Culture. Interesting. There was a deleted subplot um, of Aaron, our main character, being pregnant. And that was why um, when they went to Mexico, she didn't drink or smoke weed. I guess uh, Dolph Lundgren was asked to play Leatherface, but he turned it down. Uh, and I guess Gunnar Hansen, who played Leatherface in the original, was asked to play the role of the truck driver, but he turned it down. I'm not sure why. Um, I guess Evan Rachel Wood was considered for the role of the hitchhiker girl, and then Kirsten Dunst, Katie Holmes, and Jessica Alba were all considered to play Aaron. Which, I don't know, I could have maybe seen Kirsten Dunst, but I think Katie Holmes and Jessica Alba would not have been a good fit. Uh, I guess I... Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I forgot about this. The character Kemper shares a name with American serial killer Edmund Kemper, who murdered 10 people between 1964 and 1973. So, um, not sure why they would do that homage exactly, but um, what can you do? Oh, yeah. Okay. This reminds me. i got to read some reviews. Uh, film critic Roger Ebert gave this film a zero... a rare zero star rating. Like, he never does that. And he gave this film zero stars. So... Oh, okay. This uh, so Brett uh, Leatherface was actually supposed to be played by a guy named Brett Wagner, uh, and he was cast. And he actually the first kill in the movie with the sledgehammer uh, and Eric Balfour was Brett Wagner. Um, and Brett Wagner, um, I guess, during production got heat stroke, and he um, he was replaced. So I guess fans of the movie referred to him as the lost Leatherface because he was only in that one scene. Oh, and uh, yeah, I guess to avoid an NC-17 rating, the more graphic shots of Morgan's death, which would have involved, you know, intestines and, uh, you know, v blood and viscera falling out of him after the chainsaw, like, cut him up, would have, uh, were removed. And the hitchhiker scene, 
I guess originally had her like her ear flying off and like the blood just being um more dark and, and like a lot of more of it coming out of her head uh, and I guess they were also supposed to kill the little boy Jedediah but um, I guess they, they and they filmed a scene uh, but they scrapped it because uh, they thought the murder of a little boy Leatherface was too intense and I guess Kemper's death was originally more graphic too I guess after being hit with the sledgehammer he drops to the floor and convulses uh, as blood pours out of his head before he gets another whack so yeah, I guess um, there are a bunch. There were supposed to be a bunch more like graphic deaths, but uh, they had to cut it out to you know secure the R rating. Uh, which I don't know. Maybe they maybe they released like a director's cut or something or an uncovered, and I should try to look into that. Uh, so let's see if we can get some reviews here. Just uh, mostly negative. I saw some of them were funny. So yeah, Peter Travers uh, actually gave him a pretty good one. He said he awarded the film two stars out of four, writing director Marcus Nispel. Uh, has a sharp eye and a good sense to hire Daniel Pearl, who shot the original. But all the bad rehash mojo from Friday the 13th to Blair Witch has infected Scott Kozar's script. Hooper went for primitive. Nispel goes for slick. Hooper went easy on the gore. Nispel pours it on. And he called the film soulless. So, like, I don't know. People, he gave him some credit, but people overall kind of took this movie to task, as, as these people really love to do, uh, I think, with the horror genre anything with excessive guts or sex or anything they hate it they're like puritanical roger ebert especially i mean listen to this um he gave the film zero out of four stars calling it a contemptible film vile ugly and brutal there is not a shred of reason to see it those who defend it will have to dance through mental rings of their own devising defining it as mean defining its meanness and despair as a style or vision or commentary to our world is uh, laughable so yeah it's like uh yeah, no offense, man. It's a horror movie. It's going to be brutal and ugly and vile. So is the original. Like, what are you even talking about? Um, and, of course, he obviously calls, like, me and all the people who like this movie insane. Um, but uh, fuck them. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Uh, but, yeah, I like this movie. This movie has its has its fans. And if you haven't seen it, I would. I think it's, like, the perfect movie to watch it in the setting in which I originally watched it, which was, like, with a group of people to talk about it. I think a lot of the movies on this show will be like that, but this one especially. It's just fun. And I think it's got a lot going for it, style-wise, performance-wise. Uh, the ambiance and like the aura of this movie is really great, and I think it is like... It's like what horror movies are. You know, they're fun. They don't have to be necessarily thought-provoking. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Thought-provoking or anything like that. I think it's just a fun time. And, uh, yeah, wow, okay, I'm at an hour 42. Sorry about that, didn't mean to go so long today. Uh, so I think that's it. I don't think I have anything left in my notes or anything. So, um, I guess, uh, yeah, just make, make sure to check out Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003. Um, don't know where you'll find it, but, uh, you know, pay for it on Amazon if you want. Uh, and then, you know, just uh, be on the lookout for that uh, new one they're putting out in February. So, um, I got, yeah, um, got a new microphone. Want to give them a quick shout out. Uh, I actually can't pronounce the name of the company. So, um, I'll put a link to the microphone in the show notes here. A lot of links in the show notes today. Um, but yeah, they're, it's sponsored by that company. This episode is because, uh, I think this one, this microphone's going to work out really well. And, um, you know, big shout out to my cat rooster for sitting here on my lap for the entire entire show thanks for not leaving i appreciate the comfort that you've given me um and just um you know be on the lookout i'm working on getting these up on youtube um so if you like youtube better uh, i think it's easier to, to, you know you know you want to make comments correct me it's very easy to do that um on that uh, on that format um so yeah i appreciate you listening and uh, i'll be back sometime soon with another episode uh, I won't make any promises this time as to what the movie will be so that way I can't disappoint you um, definitely though look for Time Cop, look for Prophecy look for The Awakening uh, look for Sleepaway Camp maybe Sleepaway Camp 2 on the horizon um, there's untold movies I can do this with So, and I'm happy to do it as long as you're happy to listen and I appreciate you giving me your time and I'll uh I'll, I won't see you next time because I won't see you at all. Never see you. Uh, but uh, you'll be hearing from me soon. Okay.
All right. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. All right.